Welcome back everybody to Learn Electrics. In this video we will look at R1 plus R2. It is important that you and I as electricians fully understand what it is and what it does. It plays an important part in keeping our customers and ourselves safe during an electrical fault. Let's begin by looking at what an installation is and what parts make up an installation. We will use this socket circuit as our example as we boil the kettle. Starting on the left, we have our supply transformer, perhaps half a mile down the road. This supplies electricity to our installation. The energised electricity enters the building through the cutout fuse, and today this is usually 100 amps, and then it passes through the electricity meter so that they know how much to charge the customer. Now it passes through the circuit breaker in the consumer unit along the phase wire, which we have labelled R1 here, and into the socket. Because the kettle is plugged in and switched on, the electricity can flow into the heater element of the kettle, where it will lose its energy as it is converted into heat to boil the water. The de-energised electricity flows back along the neutral wire to the supply transformer where it is re-energised and starts the journey all over again. You will see that we have labelled the phase wire R1, the neutral as Rn and the earth or CPC as R2. In the no-fault condition, we do not have current flowing in the earth or R2, but when there is an earth fault, the current flows down this earth wire. ZS is the impedance or resistance of the whole installation. That is to say, all of the outside wiring from the consumer unit back to the supply transformer and all of the inside wiring from the consumer unit to the point of use. It uses the formula shown here. ZS equals ZE plus R1 plus R2. And we have divided our drawing into two to show this. ZE is everything on the left before the consumer unit and R1 plus R2 is everything on the right inside the building after the consumer unit. As we are only interested in R1 and R2 in this video, let's begin by removing all the things that are not part of R1 and R2. We can remove all the outside wiring, everything external. As we are dealing with faults, we don't need to worry about the neutral wire and we are only interested in the conductors that carry the fault current. So let's remove the fuses too. And we don't need the kettle either. That leaves us with just R1, the phase wire, and R2, the earth wire. But wait, you say, why is it just R1 and R2? Well, let's go over the conductor names again and follow what happens in no fault conditions and also during a fault. Firstly, no fault conditions. We've kept the drawing simple and uncomplicated. We have a water heater circuit and when switched on it draws 10 amps. The energised electricity flows through the fuse and along the phase wire marked L. The heater element has been designed by the manufacturer to take 10 amps at 230 volts. The energised electrons flow through the heater element and lose their energy by making the water hot. They then flow back to the supply transformer as 10 amps of de-energised electricity. The metal casing of the water heater is earthed and as there is no fault, there is no current in the earth wire. All of a sudden, the heater develops a fault. The metal has corroded through and there is electricity flowing from the live terminals to the casing. The electrons flow through the casing and along the earth wire back to the transformer. Because this has been designed as a low resistance fault path, the current flowing through the earth suddenly shoots up to 200 amps or more. If 200 amps flows out of the circuit along the earth, 
then 200 amps must have entered the circuit through the live or phase wire. There will be a small amount of current in the neutral wire, but the earth is carrying most. 200 amps out means that 200 amps must have flown in. During a fault, we want massive fault currents to flow. Massive currents are good. This 200 amps flowing into the circuit must go through the fuse or circuit breaker. The circuit breaker may only be rated at 16 amps and the question is, will 200 amps trip a 16 amp breaker? Of course it will. The breaker won't stand a chance. In fact, anything above 80 amps will cause a B-type breaker to trip within the required safety time. When the breaker trips or the fuse blows, this interrupts the flow of electricity. Nothing can flow into the heater circuit. Everything drops down to zero volts and zero current. We say that it has failed into a safe condition. And the bigger the fault currents, the quicker it fails into this safe condition. The danger has been removed and someone can come along and carry out any repairs that are needed. During a fault, the neutral plays very little part in what is happening, so let us remove the neutral on this drawing. We are left with just R1, the phase wire, and R2, the earth wire. And it is the massive currents that are flowing around R1 and R2 that cause the fuse to blow or the breaker to trip. Therefore, during a fault, it is the phase and earth that are of most interest. We want to know what the resistance is of these two wires, as resistance is the thing that will reduce the amount of current flowing. Resistance is the enemy. We can measure the resistance of these two wires with our test meter, after having taken appropriate steps to turn off the breaker and to isolate the circuit to prevent danger to ourselves and others. At Learn Electrics, we always recommend that you physically remove the phase or live wire from the circuit breaker and connect this to the earth terminal either directly or using small crocodile clips with a short lead. These leads should measure close to zero ohms and any resistance shown should be deducted from the readings for R1 and R2. Some books will show the connection being made with the wires that are still in the circuit breaker. And we do not recommend this, but the choice is yours. Now go to the point of use, in our case where the water heater is located. We can measure with our meter between the phase wire R1 and the earth wire R2. With the meter set to the low ohms resistance range, we can measure along R1, the phase wire, to the consumer unit through the link to the earth or R2 and back to the second probe of the test meter. This will give us a combined reading of the two cables, in other words R1 plus R2. We now have our R1 plus R2 reading. Please note that we do not, we do not need to separate this reading into two separate parts. It is the combined resistance that affects the current flow. Leave them as R1 plus R2. So why is the resistance important? As we mentioned earlier, resistance affects current flow. Resistance will slow down the flow of electrical current through a circuit. More resistance will result in less current. And if there is less electrical current, then the heater will take longer to heat the water. Less resistance, however, will allow more current to flow through the circuit the water will boil quicker. Think of resistance and current as a seesaw. Resistance on one end and the current on the other. If resistance goes down, the current goes up. If the resistance goes up, then the current goes down. It is always the resistance that needs to change before the current changes. Resistance can change the current but current can never 
change the resistance. Current is the result of what happens to the resistance. It is the fault current that determines the operating time of the breaker or fuse. Ideally, we want the biggest possible current to give us the quickest operating time. And to get the biggest current possible, we need to have the lowest resistance possible. The quicker the operating time, the quicker the fuse blows and the quicker the circuit is made safe. Putting that all together, the lower the resistance of R1 plus R2, the greater the fault current and the quicker the circuit brake operates and makes the circuit safe. So what factors can affect the resistance and how can we alter it? The size or cross-sectional area will affect it, often shortened to CSA. The thinner the copper cable, the more resistance there is to the flow of electricity and this will reduce the maximum current that can safely pass through it. The opposite is true for thicker cables. Make the CSA bigger and now more current can be passed through the copper. The length of the cables is also a big factor in resistance. A longer cable increases the resistance and reduces the current flow. Make the cable shorter and more current can pass through it safely. The table shown here illustrates these four effects. The best solution is to have thick cables on short runs. But we also have to take into account the cost of the copper cable itself. Copper is not cheap, so we need to have the cable size big enough to carry the expected fault current without overheating the cables, but not so big that we are paying for extra copper that we do not need. This is why there are tables giving maximum values of ZS, which includes R1 plus R2. ZS must be below a certain value for different sizes of breakers and fuses, and these are given in the wiring regulations and the on-site guide. We showed earlier that ZS equals ZE plus R1 plus R2. ZS is the resistance or impedance of the whole wiring system, including the outside of the building and the circuit inside the building. In other words, the whole thing. ZE, though, is the external values, and these are generally fixed for each building. It will not change. This means that ZS can only be changed by altering the value of R1 plus R2. In other words, we can only make ZS fall into line with the regulations by making changes to the internal wiring, our R1 plus R2. And the time to think about making changes and altering R1 and R2 is at the design stage. Once the cables are in place, it is so much more difficult to make the cables bigger or shorter. If ZS is too high, and we need to reduce it to meet the wiring regulations, we have just three options. Option one is to make the circuit shorter, but this is not always possible. If the water heater is upstairs, that is where it is staying. Option two is to use thicker cables, a larger cross-sectional area. And this is usually the option that is taken up at the design stage. But remember, copper cable is expensive, so we don't want to make the size of the cable too big. If the circuit is already installed, already plastered in place and decorated, then we only really have option three as a choice. If the ZS is too high for the breaker size and we cannot change the cable, then why not change the breaker size to match the ZS? We can choose a breaker whose ZS is above the R1 plus R2 resistance that we have just measured. This table shows some examples. This is also a good option when extending circuits if the ZS is already at or near the maximum and you know that extending the cables will exceed the ZS requirements. Installing a smaller breaker 
will increase the permitted ZS that you have available. Just like the seesaw, if we make the circuit breaker size lower, then the permitted ZS will go higher. Imagine that we have just measured the ZS and it's 1.3 ohms. The table shows that this is too high for a 32 amp breaker. It has a maximum of 1.1 ohms. But we could change the 32 amp breaker for a 25 amp breaker that has a maximum ZS of 1.4 ohms. 1.4 ohms maximum is less than 1.3 ohms measured, so this circuit will be safe. But wait, we cannot just change any breaker for any other. ZS rules must be followed. Look what happens if we keep the rating the same but install a different type, a C or D type. Some electricians will change the popular type B breaker for a type C where the customer complains of the breaker nuisance tripping. If you change to a type C, the permitted ZS goes down. It is now even harder to get the figures to match and cable lengths and sizes become more critical. And changing to a type D breaker makes it worse again. So please be aware of the effects of changing breaker sizes. It can sometimes work in your favour and sometimes against you. We must always think of the user's safety if something goes wrong. Well, thank you for watching this video from Learn Electrics. If you click the save button below, you can review this video later. Clicking on subscribe below will give you access to all of our tech tip videos and you'll be sure not to miss our weekly videos every Monday. Clicking on subscribe also helps us too. You can also access our videos by typing in Learn Electrics, or one word, into the YouTube search bar. We hope you enjoyed this video and we look forward to seeing you again very soon.